more potent. And there's more carbon underneath there than all the tropical rainforest. It's all going up into the atmosphere. It is a ticking time bomb. And the journal Nature this year said it's accelerating six times faster than we thought 12 months ago. That's just one feedback loop. So let me, let me end this part of the discussion with this thought. James Hansen is our chief climatologist in the United States government. He's the head of the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies. So in Brussels, we were at Cop uh, the EU was going to Copenhagen, hoping to talk the world into mitigating carbon at 450 parts per million by 2050. And nobody wants to play that game. Nobody. Even Obama, who we had high hopes for, uh, their goal by 2020, based on 1990 levels, is a 4% reduction in global warming. Uh, the EU on 1990 levels is a 20%. So the Obama administration is nowhere to be seen here. But even if we go to Copenhagen and try to get it to 450 parts per million, the EU says that would maybe keep us at two degrees. Devastating, but we may survive. Then James Hansen comes along. His team goes under the oceans and they looked at the core samples in the geological record. And he said to Brussels, you got it wrong. Because if you try to get the world to mitigate to 450 parts carbon per million, which no one wants to do, you go up six degrees Celsius in this century. And this is a quote the end of human civilization as we come to know it. That's the chief climatologist for the United States government. I hope he's wrong. My suspicion is the scientists not only are not wrong, they keep underestimating the speed of this. So we have this triple threat, a global economic meltdown, the second industrial revolution clearly on life support, it's old technology, old infrastructure. We have an energy crisis at 147 a barrel, the engine turns off. We've got real-time impacts of climate change and the UN says we have upwards of a billion people on the verge of starvation. I've never seen a moment like this in history. There is no moment like this. So we need to ask the question, what do we do? And what is missing from Copenhagen is we need an economic vision, an economic game plan for the whole human race, everyone on the same page, that may give us the precious time we need to move into a new post-carbon world. The first question we need to ask is, when do the great economic revolutions in history happen? How do they occur? They occur when two things happen. First, we change the way we organize the energy of the Earth. And we've done that on many occasions uh, as a, in our small sojourn here as human beings. But second, and equally important, we have a communication revolution that allows us to manage the new energy revolutions. It is those in frequent moments in history where energy and communication revolutions converge when they come together, those are the pivotal points in history. They change the human equation. They even change consciousness. I'll give you an example. Uh, many people take an anthropology course at the university and they study the Sumerians in Mesopotamia. Why? They create the first urban life and the, be the beginning of civilization. They captured the sun in photosynthesis in cereal crops, barley and wheat. That stored sun in the grain was energy, built an urban civilization. It was complicated because before that time, people lived in small tribal units, garden, agriculture, and pastoralism. All of a sudden, they had to bring them together and indenture thousands of men to build those canals. Then they had to create craft skills to create the dikes and the mechanics. They had to put together granaries, royal roads, and distribution systems. So hydraulic agriculture was extremely complicated and required a communication revolution to manage it. The Sumerians invented cuneiform, writing. Everywhere you see these great hydraulic agricultural civilizations in the Middle East, the Indus Valley in India, the Yangtze in China, Mexico, it's fascinating. Independently, humans created some form of writing to manage hydraulic agriculture. That's the agricultural age, 10,000 year multiplier effect. In the 1820s, we introduced steam technology into print, so it wasn't just manual. So linotype, rotary, steam technology allowed us to really create cheap, mass-produced, efficient print. Then in America and Europe, between 1830 and 1880, around that same time, we introduced public schools, mass literacy, and we prepared a communication revolution and a workforce that was literate that could then manage coal, steam, and rail and the complexities of the first industrial revolution. We could not have organized it in oral culture and with codex. It's obvious, but no one actually stopped to think about it. This, we had another convergence of communication energy in the early 20th century. First generation electricity, 
telegraph was transitional between the first and second industrial revolution, the telephone. And then as marketing tools, cinema and radio, and later TV. This communication electricity revolution converged with oil, the internal combustion engine, and suburban rollout to give us a second industrial revolution. Those energies are in sunset now, coal, oil, gas, and uranium for that revolution. And the technologies and infrastructure of that second industrial revolution is old, senescent, and on life support. It collapsed last summer. We are, however, on the cusp of now of a third industrial revolution. It could get us through the door, maybe, maybe, I don't know, to address the enormity of climate change. I don't know if we'll get there in time. We had a very powerful communication revolution in the last 15 years. The personal computer and the internet. Satellite, wireless, and Wi-Fi connectivity. What is so interesting about this second generation communication revolution is it's quite different than the first. When I grew up on the first, centralized communications, top down. The second revolution is what we call distributed. And this is the key word. If people hear nothing else about what I'm saying. Distributed, distributed, distributed. Now, two billion young people can send their own video, audio, and text to each other at the speed of light, open source, peer-to-peer. -peer. It's completely distributed. Think file sharing, YouTube, Wikipedia, revolution. Facebook, it's a revolution, the blogosphere. This uh, ICT revolution, communication information revolution, is just now, in the last year, beginning to converge with a new energy regime, distributed energy. When distributed communication converges and begins to manage distributed energy, we have a powerful third industrial revolution that could jumpstart the global economy, take us to post-carbon era, create a sustainable quality of life if we get there in time. All right. So what are distributed energies? We have to distinguish them from elite energies, which I grew up on. Elite energies are coal, oil, gas, and uranium because they're not found in the backyard. They're only found in certain places in the world. So right away, they require huge military investments to secure them, because everyone wants them, huge geopolitical investments to manage them, everyone wants them, and massive capital to organize them. Coal, oil, gas, and uranium are the most centralized elite energies for complex civilization ever created. They're on life support. What are distributed energies? After this interview, go outside in your home, and you'll have all the energy you need in the backyard. The sun shines all over the world every day. The wind blows across the planet every day. We have a hot earth underneath us. It's the core of the earth is red hot for geothermal heat everywhere. We have garbage that can be recycled to energy. We have rural agricultural and forestry waste into energy. Wherever you have your water, you can have hydroelectricity. The ocean tides are coming in every day, energy. So we have what we call distributed energies, renewables. They're found in every square inch of the water and land mass of this planet. So we have to think distributed. And the way to do that is pillar two. And that is everyone listening to this should imagine that their building they're in right now becomes a power plant. I'm talking about every home, office, factory, technology park, every single building in this world in 30 years is converted to a partial power plant so that it, you can put a solar roof and suck the sun's energy into your house, into electricity. You can have vertical wind coming up the wall of your building, put it into electricity. The heat under the ground with a heat pump, geothermal, turn it into electricity. The small water supplies near you, turn it into electricity with hydro. The rural agricultural waste, turn it into electricity and your house collects it. If your home or your building, your office is on the coast, ocean tides. So the buildings, interesting enough, are the problem, they're also the solution. A third of the energy used in the world is buildings, and they're a, commit a third of the CO2. They're the number one cause of climate change. By the way, while we're on this, the number three cause of climate change is worldwide transport. 